What's going on, everybody? I am here with the author of our book this week, Steve Patrick, uh, and we are going to be getting into his book, Level the Playing Field. Steve, I wanted to start off uh, for anybody, uh, if there is anybody in our audience who doesn't already know who you are, uh, tell, tell the audience, who are you, what do you do, um, to begin off? So I started out about 22 and a half, almost 23 years ago uh, in the construction industry. I worked for another fellow for a little while. He ended up being a liar and I had to start my own company because the guy wouldn't stop lying to my clients. And so I started my own construction company and I did that for a little over five years and uh, things got really slow in Dallas. I mean, like we were doing kitchens and bathrooms. There was no <laughs> hell or wind and Dallas is notor notorious for hell and wind. And we didn't have any for like almost two years. And uh, I had gotten my adjuster's license, not because I wanted to be an adjuster, because I never did. I'd gotten my adjuster's license so that when I meet an adjuster up on a roof, I could pull it out on my wallet and say, look, I'm an adjuster too. And back then they would go, oh, uh, you know, that instant credibility, you know, rapport thing. And um, so I could get those borderline roof spot back then. So anyway, I don't know if it still works, but it did back then. And then we had um, three hurricanes hit Florida the same year in the fall, uh, about 16 years ago. And uh, so my business partner said, hey, man, we're sucking the wind around here. Let's go and work. So I worked that storm. That was Hurricane Ivan. And then I worked uh, Katrina. And I was training, field training adjusters in Katrina. We worked Wilma. I mean, just about every major health, uh, hurricane since then. And uh, <clears throat> so it was on Hurricane... Let's see, I can't remember which one it was. I was <clears throat> in the evenings, I was writing, writing. I didn't start out to write a book. The, a couple of the chapters in the book, I had started out to write, like for example, the uh, chapter on not eating deductibles. It was designed to be a front and back page color thing that you could laminate and hand, the contractor could hand it to the client and they could read it and they go, oh, I'd be stupid for you to eat my deductible. Or I had a couple other chapters like that, that it wasn't even designed to be a book. You could just take the two, the two sheets, laminate them back to back, and have the client read the information. And they go, oh, I would be stupid to put my claim out for a bit. You know, the silly yep. things that, that consumers come up with these ideas. All the consumers come up with the same ideas. They have these, all the, they think they're a genius. And so I would write these, uh, you know, two page deals. And uh, so, and then I started writing and it was very popular. And a lot of people like I, I would give them out at the North Texas Roofing Contractors Association, you know, and I had just hundreds of people that were interested in those things. And I started writing more and more. And the next thing you know, it's a book. Yep. There it is. Level the playing field. And so, um, I'm about to, I'm actually about to divide it into two books because it's too thick. It's like over 200 pages. It's too much. So I'm going to divide it. The first half is consumer, uh, is really for consumers. And the second half is for professionals, whether they be contractors or uh, PAs, plaintiff attorneys, whatever the case may be, um, supplement companies. Um, so uh, I know that uh, there's a couple companies using it as a, um, workbook to train PAs. And uh, so anyway, that's how it came about. I'm about to divide it into two separate books, uh, the consumer edition, which is the first half of the current and the professional edition. Plus I've got several chapters I'm writing. I'm in the process of writing. So uh, there'll be an upda updated version by the end of the year. Very good. Um, I am going to, I'm going to bring in TJ Ware. Morning. TJ is joining us. He is uh, down working uh, this most recent hurricane right now. So he's jumping in a second late, um, but not missing much. Uh, I wanted to, uh, real briefly, I'm, I'm going to touch on something Steve had said, and then TJ, I want you to, to introduce yourself uh, to anybody that doesn't know you here, here watching the, the stream. Um, but uh, I was telling Steve, I watched, or I had read some pieces of this book. Uh, Steve had referenced it in some of his trainings. I had seen uh, you know, looked things up, you know, seen things, comments and that type of thing and, and looked at pieces of it. But I'd never read the whole thing front to back until this week. 
Uh, and I will tell you for any roofing or restoration contractor or anybody that's doing any amount of insurance work, uh, you will make up your money and time in spades. If you take off a day, just whatever, two weeks from now, schedule a day on your calendar, nothing else is happening and sit your butt on the couch and read through this whole thing. And I promise you, uh, it, you know, I, cause that's basically what I did over this past week. I didn't do it all in one day. Uh, but I promise you, you will learn so much that you will, you will make money on the things that you learned, uh, far more than what you could have done in production in that day. Uh, so I want to encourage people, if you are in this industry in any capacity, uh, it's a free book. Every book that we've reviewed so far uh, has cost 20, 30 bucks. This one is completely free. Uh, if you don't take advantage of this, I can't help you. Uh, Steve can't help you, nobody can. Uh, but uh, that that's just the one quick thing that I wanted to touch on there. Uh, TJ, tell the audience who you are, man. Hey everybody, TJ Ware, Paradise Claims. Uh, Steve, Matt, great to see both you guys. Uh, thanks for having me on with y'all. Um, you know, for years, Matt, uh, at both my PA firm and the construction company that I had before, this book's actually been required reading for everybody. Um, it's It gives a really good uh, foundational example of the whole uh, situation that we're in in this industry and, you know, how the perspective is different from, from each side in the industry. And so I think it is, uh, I'm excited that you're going to break it up, Steve, into another, uh, into another part just aimed at homeowners. I think it's a really good resource. Um, I'm out here in the field, obviously, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Today I was uh, out on the east side of the city where there's massive damage to big residential neighborhoods. And already these policyholders are learning that their insurance company is not the ally that they thought they were a few days ago. So things, the situation here is changing very quickly and without someone to explain it in the way that Steve does in the Level of Playing Field book, people would never really assume or understand how this industry works, how it's set up, and um, you know what the duties of an insurance company are, the duties of an insured, and how the contractor insured uh, and insurance company relationships really work. So that's a great resource, and I wish that more people had access to it. It really helps that it's a free resource. That's uh, that's why we, we definitely recommend it to people. We've recommended it to the policyholders we work for. And like I said, it's required reading at Paradise Claims. So we definitely appreciate the resource that it is. Awesome. And I, I appreciate your, your perspective on that. Um, I wanted to jump in. You talked about, TJ, you just talked about homeowners in, in this sense. Uh, in this book, obviously, Steve, uh, you work appraisals, and uh, in this book talks a lot about appra the appraisal process. Uh, and one of the things that it made me realize about this, the whole aspect of level the playing field, right? It's one guy against a team of 100, uh, you know, and really it's probably a team of thousands. Um, really, this is, uh, I thought of it like the old aspect of like medieval warfare, where instead of our armies battling, which my army is me versus a whole army, let's let's both have a champion come out. They can battle it out, and then everybody you know uh, goes based on that that aspect. Uh, and and I, I love that that ability to, like you said, level the playing field. Uh, I, I, you were the one that was clever with that. I can't can't steal that away from you. But for for homeowners that are getting ready to go through this process, that have an insurance claim uh, that, that's going to appraisal, um, is this something that you recommend for, for contractors to put in the hands of their homeowner and say, hey, I know you don't wanna go read some book about insurance, but you need to read this. Uh, you know, here's, here's sections that you should read um, ahead of going into the appraisal process. What I would suggest is that you not give them a big, thick book and say, read this, because they yeah. won't. Uh, sure. It's human nature. They just, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll read it, and they'll set it aside. But rather, say, here's a chapter that I believe that really fits your set of circumstances, and it can make a significant impact in your claim 
if you're able to implement some of the tactics that are explained in this chapter. It's only a few pages long. It'll take a few minutes of your time. And I'd like you to do me a favor and, and read this and then get back with me and we could um, formulate a strategy on going forward. Uh, reading a, a chapter or two and see, you have to have read the book to know what's in there and what's available and what chapters might be ap applicable to any given client's set of circumstances that they find themselves in. It really wasn't designed to be like a novel <laughs> that we, you would read. It's more designed to be a reference manual and uh, yep. ooh, everything just blinked. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and so um, I know there are a lot, uh, many folks that have read the entire thing from uh, soup to nuts, but, uh, but as far as the consumer goes, that's what I would recommend. Say, uh, you know, if, if you want them to understand about appraisal, then have them read the two chapters in the book about appraisal. They don't have to read the first half of the book if the only thing yeah. they need to understand is just, you know, the appraisal chapter or two. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I know the two of you know each other pretty well. Uh, you're at a lot of the same events. Uh, your, your paths cross quite a bit. Uh, with, with Steve, you working appraisals, TJ, you working PAs. Uh, where do you guys see uh, those having those healthy relationships between the two so they're not at odds with each other, that they're really filling in the gaps and, and working in the right situations? Uh, TJ, could you could you kind of touch on that? So I really don't see it as a conflict. Honestly, I see it more as a synergistic thing because there's a place for a public adjuster and there's a place for appraisal. I think that people that have been around this or that, that know the business well understand that difference. It can be a little bit nuanced. It's difficult for contractors that are newer to these, uh, to these processes to really understand which path to go. But uh, we, we refer appraisals out, refer them over to Steve and his team on a regular basis. Um, you know, if there's a coverage dispute and somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm thinking about putting this um, in appraisal. They said there's a cosmetic exclusion on all the metal. I'm going to put it into appraisal to get everything bought. I say, listen, that might not be the best usage for the appraisal process because when that award gets over to the carrier, they're still going to refuse, uh, you know, most likely refuse to pay out for the, uh, the portion that they're calling cosmetic damage because there's a coverage issue there. Now, when, when there is a dispute over price uh, or the amount of loss, but all of the coverage issues are settled, then oftentimes that's a better scenario for appraisal. We're very open about the fact that if you come to me, if you come to our firm, you know, we're not always working uh, residential claims, but when we are at, at times, if you come to me, with you've got this big house it's an all-state claim uh, they've they're trying to replace part of the roof and a little bit of exterior damage we're not going to take it and the reason we're not going to take it is because i've learned this the hard way we'll take that claim we'll work it as hard as we can and then what do we end up doing throw it in you know throwing in an appraisal because Appraisal is not a magic bullet, but there are certain scenarios with certain carriers where it's the best tool that we currently have. And ultimately, because we want to provide a good value for the contractors that refer us, we want there to be money left over for them to be able to serve their customer well. That, that scenario that I explained to you, when we did take those claims that usually resulted in us agreeing to discount our fees significantly so they could afford to pay an appraiser to actually get the amount uh, you know that that should have been assigned in the beginning and so we found that it made more sense and it took workload off of us uh, just to go ahead and refer that over to an appraiser in the beginning of that process and never accept it as a PA claim so there's no reason that it should be conflicting uh, if all parties understand the purpose of each process and which claims would be better suited uh, to one process or the other. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that. But I wanted you guys to uh, to be able to teach that because that, I think that is a nuance that not everyone understands about these two different processes. This morning I had a call from a contractor who has a client in another state from Texas. Uh, and his situation was they had an event in a single day and this carrier is trying to is already 
saying two events, two deductibles, and trying to do three. And he was trying to refer it to us in appraisal. Uh, the scope was already agreed to. The issue was, is this one event or is it two events or they're trying to make it three? So there's three deductibles and they had a 2% deductible. That'd be a 6% deductible when their policy says two. And so likewise, I said, you know, that is not the realm. That's not in our lane. That's not the realm of an, of an appraiser. That's the realm of a public adjuster because your issue at hand is a coverage issue. Is this covered under one claim, two claims, or three? Because it was the same event. And that would be uh, under the venue of a uh, public adjuster. So, very good. Very good. No, no one circumstance handles all of it. I actually wrote an article about this uh, and I posted it a couple of times on our forum, Level the Playing Field. If you're on the forum, go to the left, um, the search bar, and type in. Um, uh, target, T-A-R-G-E-T, -E like the store, and it comes up and I explain um, what circumstances are best for appraisal, which ones are best for a public adjuster, and which ones are best for uh, litigation. And it helps those who aren't as familiar be able to discern which pile to put each client in or refer them to anyway. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's a great resource. So, uh, Steve, I want to have you ex kind of a toss up question for you. Uh, this book talks about a lot of different topics. Uh, if, if a contractor, you want to get a contractor hooked on reading this book, what is one chapter, one section of this that is going to instantly give them some value uh, that's going to get them hooked to read the whole thing? Those two initial chapters that I wrote, uh, it, the ones where uh, the thing about it is, is a contractor trying to tell a consumer that we won't eat your deductible for this reason, or it's stupid, you're being foolish to put your claim out for bid to see who can save the insurance company the most money, or you're not going to be able to game the system so that uh, you're going to be able to put money in your pocket and get your work done. Many of them think that they can, they can, you know, go out and, and do it, you know, bid the job, get a lower bid and the difference they get to keep in their pocket. They don't understand recoverable depreciation and, and the documentation you need to be able to, to do that. And so right. those chapters are the ones that I initially wrote for contractors. And those are the ones going to have the greatest impact because if you have a client, Look, if the, if the contractor is saying you can't do that, the contractor has a financial, you know, incentive because the consumer knows the contractor wants their price to be higher so that they make more money. But if they have them read a book from a claims professional who used to run my own adjuster school, I used to license and train claims adjusters. And that gives me a lot of credibility because I'm no longer a contractor, nor I have I been. So I don't have a financial interest in the outcome one way or another. And they can have them read the book that gives instant credibility. Human beings, if you've, if you've written a book, uh, you're a published author, that gives people instant credibility in the consumer's eyes. And so they see that, that there's this, you know, published author writing about these very issues and they take five minutes to read those short chapters and they go, oh, I would be a fool to do that. Okay, I don't want to put my claim out for bed anymore or whatever. And so those chapters are the ones, I think there's like three or four of them. Uh, it's been five years since I, read, since I wrote those. Um, I think it's about three or four of them uh, at the beginning of the uh, consumer edition of the book. Awesome, no, the awesome, of the awesome, book. awesome. Uh, I know we did a video earlier this week uh, telling people exactly how to get this book. Uh, do you want to just quickly give a plug? Uh, and it's a plug for a free book, right? Uh, but how people can download this book and, and have access to it uh, if they don't have it already. Yeah, all you have to do is text the word ebook, no hyphen, just five letters, E B O O K, to the following phone number, 214. 
51, 82. Man, you already, man, look at that. Down across the, the bottom there. <laughs> yeah, man, it's like we're on the good. news, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So just text, text the word ebook to that phone number and, um, and then answer a couple questions your name, phone number, company you work for, email address, the name of your firstborn child. I'm just kidding. Yep. And, uh, and we don't spam people. Uh, you won't have anyone telling yep. people. I can testify spam. to that. Uh, yeah. I downloaded it and I didn't get, uh, get didn't get spammed. So, there you go. Um, guys, I, you know, I I want to make sure that we we take advantage of the time that we've got here. Uh, TJ, uh, I really respect a lot of the the work that you've done in this industry and, and just kind of your attitude. We've talked kind of at length about you know how we we like to conduct business. Um, I know you were a contractor yourself in the past and you've you've gone to the PA side, yes? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I, right. I had a construction yeah. restoration company for seven years in Dallas, Fort Worth. Tell me, uh, I guess if, if you were still as a, working as a contractor rather than a PA, um, it, any, any perspective you can offer uh, on whether it's this book or just kind of how, how to approach claims as a contractor, I know you're you're approaching them as a PA, so you're working on deals that are that are PA deals. But how would you approach the market at large? Well, I do think that as a contractor these days, um, you have to be a little bit more careful, maybe than certain times in past. Uh, obviously, we know there's been legislation passed with the intention of limiting the contractor's interaction with the carrier on certain issues. The unfortunate effect of that is that representatives for insurance carriers now use that as a bully tactic for contractors. So essentially, you know, if you're a contractor and you're working insurance restoration jobs and, and you're handling a job where the adjuster is, is locking up, the adjuster's not communicating, the adjuster's not playing ball, you have to do something in order to make sure that you can get this job paid for, your customer is going to be taken care of, and all the repairs can be made. So I would say uh, one thing that I recommend to people all the time is don't hold on to it too long. The longer that you hold on to it, it seems like the, uh, the, the poorer the eventual outcome usually is. So if you're if you work if I was a contractor now, I would probably refer uh, refer more files out. Uh, you know, recommend more appraisers and PAs because essentially in this business, time is money, and uh, w when you come to a point dealing with an insurance adjuster where that adjuster is no longer being reasonable, I do think that in in many cases appraisal is a very good tool because what it does is it takes that file out of the hands of that adjuster. It takes it off of their desk and hands it over to an appraisal panel. And appraisal is something that has now become very specialized. And it's very important that you don't just, used to, you would hire another roofer. You know another roofer, hey, do this appraisal for me. Now there is strategy that has to go into this process. There are relationships and knowledge that exists between the appraisers and especially when it comes to umpires and umpire selection. So I would, I would encourage people to connect with an appraiser that really understands appraisal, that understands the umpire selection process, because as many of us know, that's one of the most important, uh, important parts of the appraisal process and connecting with a, uh, an appraiser that understands that and has a good history of finding uh, good umpires to work those appraisals. It's probably the most, the, the most important part of the entire process is the selection of the appraiser to make sure that they're competent because many are not. I know because we get called by contractors and consumers say that we have this guy who's doing our appraisal and he screwed it all up. Can you fix this? And uh, you know, <laughs> you're stuck with the outcome. Uh, so you better hire a competent one. That's for sure. And then the second most important thing is your competent appraiser for him to make sure 
that the umpire, if, if they end up having to use him, is number one, unbiased. That's the most important thing, because if he's biased, it turns the entire process into a farce. Number two, that he's competent. So if you're up on a built up roof and the guy only knows shingles, that, <laughs> that isn't gonna work. And the third thing that we look for in an umpire is uh, you know reasonable availability. It's not gonna take months before the guy can get around to it. So those are the three uh, in, in the order of, of importance of selecting an umpire. Very good. Um, I, I think that's an important distinction about this process really the if you're choosing that champion to fight for your entire army uh you want to make sure you you know you get hercules right um but i, I want to uh you know i know i've i've probably thrown some softballs to you because i like you and i like your book and i like what you're about uh but i want to i want to throw up a a little bit more controversial question about the appraisal process sure. and, and i know you'll slam it have a grand slam anyway but uh, tell me what is your, your thought on the, uh, the commonly used term splitting the baby. Um, uh, I've seen, I've seen contra or not contractors. I've seen lawyers use that, that term against the appraisal process, uh, it, and saying, Hey, if you, and I think this goes to what you had said about having a, uh, a biased, uh, umpire, but when does that happen? Is, is that something that is avoidable uh, in the appraisal process? It's laziness. That's what splitting the baby is. Instead of you doing your due diligence and actually appraising the loss, if you're an appraiser, what does an appraiser do? They do an appraisal. And it's not that different than what the contractors do when they go out and take a look uh, at the property. They do a damage assessment. They determine uh, make sure that everything is accounted for and that all the damage has been located. Then they determine a means and method of repair based on the, you know, the extent of damage, repairability issues, making sure that you maintain a reasonably uniform appearance, those sorts of things. Then you put together an appraisal. It's essentially the same thing as an estimate, but in appraisal, it's not an estimate. It's, it's, it's an appraisal. So the appraiser creates an appraisal. Maybe they use Xactimate, maybe they don't. And then they meet with the other appraiser who's done their appraisal and they put the two side by side and they determine what remains in dispute between the two. And those are the things that iron sharpens iron and you try to work out. Uh, splitting the baby would be like, well, there's 10 things in dispute, so I'll give you your five and I'll take my five or something like that. That's exceedingly lazy. We have a vetting questionnaire that we do when we're vetting umpires. And one of the questions on the, the questionnaire is, do you split the baby? And if you do, uh, you know, I've done almost 2000 appraisals in 22 years. And I bet you on count on one hand, the number of times that I've allowed that. I mean, I didn't allow it. Uh, that it's happened uh, because because I you know argue against it vehemently and uh, it's just pure laziness that's what it is sure sure um, that that makes perfect sense I wanted to to bring that up because that is something that's out there uh, in like I said from from lawyers in the the industry uh, I've seen that that argument made to go with litigation rather than than appraisal um, Guys, you, you guys both know I'm very much about systems uh, and I am very much about documenting thoroughly, uh, whether you're a contractor, an appraiser, a PA, uh, that is a critical part of all of our jobs. Um, I, I wanna ask both of you, but I'm gonna start with TJ. TJ, uh, you don't have to get into every step of the process, we've talked about this, but systematically, is there a way that you approach a, a inspection and documentation to, to make sure that it's done thoroughly every time? You know, uh, we were, we call it our flow, right? Um, you know, I, I'm also a pilot. Uh, when you're in an emergency situation, you go straight to muscle memory. Okay. Fuel tanks, both fuel, fuel pump on mixture rich, you know, all of these things that you do in an airplane, because, you, as long as you do it the same way every single time, 
your muscles naturally go to that next thing that you're supposed to go to. It should be no different when you're doing, let's say, in a residential inspection. You take your picture of the of the front of the house, right? If every single time you take a picture of the front of the house, then every time you're looking through a photo, you can scroll back to the front, the, the front elevation, and that's your house. You put the ladder up there. Every time you climb that ladder to get on that roof, you look for that starter shingle. You look for that drip edge. Uh, you know, you put your shingle gauge on there. You check the thickness. You document that in a photograph. If you do it the same, so the same way every time, then uh, it's really going to help you in your process. I'll tell you today, we uh, I walked up on a, uh, a loss that we just got down here, ten story, ten story high rise downtown Lake Charles, Louisiana. I asked James that works for me. I said, hey, do you have a company cam album? Because I'm going to start snapping pictures. He says, no, 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 stop, stop. You're going to mess up my flow. Just let me do it the way that I do it. I'm just trying to be helpful. Uh, yeah. But he says, no, I've got to start at the front elevation or you're going to screw up my entire flow. And so I respected that. I appreciated that because those workflows are what keep us organized. And so if you're working with somebody that has that, you don't want to break that. You want to do it in a way that makes them the most efficient. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Steve? I was teaching the exact same thing, precisely what he said for 15 years. When I first started teaching, uh, or even longer than that, back when I was teaching brand new salesmen working at my company back in the day, is I would tell them, this is the process that we do. Here's where you start on the house every single time and you go clockwise around the house. And if you do it the exact same way every time, you don't forget stuff and you don't miss stuff because you have a process and, you're, and you don't allow someone to distract you. Oh, by the way, let me show you the attic. No, 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 <laughs> Mrs. Jones, I don't wanna miss anything and I wanna make sure I account for everything. So let me go through my process. And once I finish, then please do show me the attic rather than allowing them to be distracted and you go off on a rabbit trail and you miss stuff. And so TJ is exactly right. You have a, a process, you know, there's four things you do at the top of, of every ladder before getting on a pitched roof. And if you do all four of those things every time, you won't forget to, to do the pitch gauge or what, or the shingle gauge or whatever the case may be. And so in fact, that's in my book as well. Uh, I have a chapter on photographically documenting the loss because I used to teach this to claims adjusters and uh, wow, contractors really don't know how to do this very well. Uh, they either have all close-ups or all far, you know, name this shingle. And it's like, you're 50 feet from the house. You can't see the shingle. You're on the roof across the street, <laughs> right? And uh, so I wrote, so what I did is I took my chapter from my uh, claims adjuster book, and then I took it and rewrote it for uh, contractors and PAs. And I put it in my most recent version of the book to, teach contractors how to properly document their loss using a camera. Yeah. Cons consistently, you know, that's something that I have always told people and taught people. Um, if we're going to be getting an estimate from a contractor, then it's important that they, you know, that they perform that documentation in the beginning. And, uh, you know, they say a picture says a thousand words. The other day I got roped into doing an appraisal. I don't love doing appraisals. But I got roped into doing appraisal because this is the second loss at the same apartment complex where the roof had been blown off. This was a tornado and a windstorm came two years ago, blew the complete roof, flat roof, everything off of an adjacent building. Well, the same building now, uh, a tornado blew the roof off from the top plate. Everything was gone above it. So the entire roof structure, everything was gone. So they said, will you please do this appraisal again? You've done this before. Well, you know, this was probably about a $1.7 million loss. Uh, my estimate had 3,300 uh, line items and a public adjuster had been, had been working on the file. And so I was looking at the photographs from when the loss took place. You know, this was a year ago or more that it took place. Uh, it's almost completed now and it's in the appraisal process. There are 62 photographs. 62 photographs for a 3,300 line item estimate. And so here I am at the table with the opposing appraiser for 10 hours, and I've got 62 photographs, and 45 of them are of the roof blown off. 
Nice. Of the, the, the roof that isn't there, right? Uh, yeah. I Yeah, I can really, I talk to contractors every day that are my clients uh, or potential clients, and we talk about their inspection process. Um, you know, that's part of how we build value and, and show transparency to insurance agents to get their business. And, you know, so I'll ask every single contractor that I talk to, you know, what is your inspection process? How many photos are you taking? And you will not believe how often guys go, oh, we take a ton of photos. And, and I'm like, okay, cool. What is what is a ton? Define. And define a ton. Uh, because a ton means a lot of different things. And I have contractors that a ton means 300. Uh, and I'm like, all right, cool. You're good. Uh, and I have contractors that literally a ton of photos is 10 to 15 photos. And you could not tell where these photos were taken because they're two feet away from the roof uh, or, you know, whatever it is there, there's no context for any of the photos. You don't know where they're at. Uh, and so that has been, you know, that's not necessarily what I teach uh, in my, you know, my consulting, but it, it's become a, a part of it because you can't do all the rest of it. Just like you guys can't do an appraisal or, uh, you know, as a PA, you're taking those photos typically, but you can't do your job unless that piece has been done already. Uh, well, you know, the contractor is there right after the loss, oftentimes before temporary repairs have been made. Uh, a public yeah. adjuster or an appraiser is likely to come into the process long after a lot of the repairs have been done. So we don't have the opportunity to go back in time and retake those photos. That really has to be done at that time by the contractor, or you know what? You, you might never get paid for a lot of those things because we can't just say, hey, trust me, it, this was there or that was there. We need the documentation. Yeah, yeah, we had, uh, I, I told the story before, last year went out and was working a, a multifamily claim in Fort Collins, Colorado, and uh, it was 20 buildings, all three story. I had to document them all myself. Uh, and ended up taking, I think it was about 6,000 photos uh, of this, all the elevations, all the roof, every, every accessory, all this stuff. Uh, and as soon as I finished with the last building, literally the next day, it got hit with a hailstorm again. Uh -huh. and, and a bigger storm than what had hit it before. But you had the document. And, and, the, <laughs> and, we, had, and we had the adjusters, uh, the whole team of adjusters scheduled to come out but they hadn't been out yet. And, and so we had the issue uh, and also the policy, their deductible had changed from, uh, oh. it, it basically doubled. Uh, and so we had, it was about a hundred thousand dollars for the, the new de second deductible that they were gonna have to pay if not for the photos that we had before. And so for the guys that say, Oh, well, I'll take them when the adjuster comes out or I'll take them later. If you're if it hailed there once, it can hail there again. Uh, and you have no control over whether that's an hour before the adjuster shows up uh, or 10 years from now. Uh, and so I, I implore guys to to take as many photos as possible the first time you get there uh, with context and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, we're study, we're going to. Yeah. Study my chapter on photographically documenting the loss. Study that chapter. It's the exact same thing I taught uh, claims adjusters back in the day when I had my school. Uh, <clears throat> proper documentation is king. That is your best friend. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I tell guys all the time, they, you know, they sit there and cry about adjusters denying their claims and that type of thing. Uh, and they won't document a claim as well as the adjuster did. If you, you know, these guys, there are adjusters who are professional that are really smart people. There's a lot of them that aren't. And if you can't be more competent to that guy than that guy who isn't, then you don't deserve to get that extra money. Uh, so that's the rant over. Uh, I want to, uh, before we close here, just real quickly, anything else you guys want to add to the conversation? I, I uh, want to have you, Steve. Yeah. I want to ask you something, Matt. Number one, we're down here. Every, everybody in town looks. What's up, fellas? <laughs> What's up, this, Anthony? Uh, this is Anthony Dometto, 
Del Medico oh. cameo here. Guys, this we're, is going, a cameo. we're going to. Uh, hey, I got we're setting up the Alpha Alpha right here. This place is a damn war zone. So that's what I was going to say. When are you guys going to come down here? Because I'm sure both of you at some point are going to need to come down here and uh, and help these people rebuild this place. Steve, let's just be honest. It's time to get back in the field, buddy. This is the one. <laughs> Seriously. That's good. We're hey, gonna I'll, I'll... We have to deploy here for 30, 60 days. I'm, bringing my, I'm going to rotate my team out here. It's a big one. Because they I'll need help. It's, it's, it's bad. They need help. I mean, there's not there's not enough uh, anybody here right now. You know, FEMA's here. That FEMA's not doing nothing. No, FEMA's doing nothing for these people nothing. so far. Government's doing nothing. The only people that are doing anything here are the freaking storm contractors. That's it. Yeah. The yeah. big guys. If they weren't here, none of this should be dried in. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? And I'll tell you, the millions of dollars so far that have been spent have all been funded and financed. By private companies and by contractors. By the storm, by the storm chasers, the ho the horrible yeah. storm chasers are saving people's lives here, and we're feeding them. All right, yeah, we're gonna yeah. finish up here, Matt. You guys, uh, you guys should come down here and broadcast because this is gonna be the base of operations for a lot of different companies for many months to come. Cool. Awesome. I'll uh, schedule time to get down there for a day or two. Thank you. Absolutely, Steve. Can you uh, before we close out? Uh, can you? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've got going on right now. If contractors are wanting to learn more from what you're doing, what events do you have coming up? Uh, what opportunities do they have to learn other than just downloading the book and reading the book? I do, uh, I do private two day trainings for lots of different companies. And um, all you have to do is give me a ring on my phone and uh, we can schedule one up for you. Um, on the 17th and 18th in a couple weeks, I'm doing an overhead and profit webinar on Thursday. And then the next day, Friday, I'm doing a, a free, for everyone who signs up for the overhead and, prof, overhead and profit webinar, I'm doing a, the second day free for all those folks uh, doing our appraiser umpire class. And so here I'll type in the, uh, the website where you guys can go and read about this and uh and sign up there you go i'll grab there that and uh onp.com um every one of our classes the two-day classes these webinars everything we always do a hundred percent money back guarantee and i've never had anyone ask for their money back so they must you guys must like the classes uh and they must be beneficial and and they're making you money which is the whole deal <laughs> yeah i so know i've our got company, our training company is called t1p top one percent our goal is to help owners and salesmen get in the top one percent you know the dreaded one percenters right that the that certain uh, political parties are always uh, talking bad about we want to get you up in the top one percent of all income earners nationally and i know quite a number of people that are well into the one percent top one percent and we know how to get you there so hey we put on these classes on a, on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I will say I've got several of my clients that have attended that seminar, that GCONP, and every one of them has said that it was awesome. Uh, so I, I haven't heard a single bad thing about it. Uh, otherwise, I probably wouldn't have had you on the show, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, guys, I appreciate so much you guys taking time to yeah. be on this. Uh, TJ, you stay safe out there. Uh, Steve, you too, but you're in your office right now. So, yep, yep. um, and, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch here and look forward to seeing you guys are, are the two, either of you going to RoofCon out in, uh, in Houston next month? Yes. yes. Yeah, I'll okay. be on the commercial roofing panel there. Uh, I'm not sure what else we got a big booth set up. Um, you know, with the COVID thing that happened that shut everybody down. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing all you guys in person. I, I see Steve. I just saw him the other day. We had lunch. Matt, it's been a while since I've seen you. So, uh, hook that's up right. My, my my RoofCon booth is actually across from yours, diagonal across from yours. So, okay. Well, I'll, I'll okay. see you there. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. I'm definitely going to be there. All right, guys. Uh, good talking with you. We'll see you next time. All Excellent. Right. Good Thanks. visit with you guys. All right.